Okay, one thing I wanted to talk about a little bit as we drive around is the concept of radiuses and speed and timing in our cars. I've spent the last 30 plus years working on race cars, building race cars, and racing cars. And I'm here to help you better understand racing technology. I don't ever see anybody talking about this too much. Everybody knows that you have to adjust your tie rods and adjust your um, four links in the back or your panard bar a number of inches or uh, you know number of degrees, but they don't really talk about timing of this stuff. And it operates like it would in a circle. Think about your tie rods, I guess, in the front. This is where I got kind of hooked on this thing, is when I did my Ackerman video. And I've been thinking about it for a long time, but then I really started thinking about it more and realized that I don't think it is very common to think about radiuses in your car in the terms of speed and time. When your radius rods, say, are at the top of a circle, the first couple degrees off of center will always be slower when things are turning than when it gets further down on the center of the circle. Things will start speeding up. When you think about the radius and speed, if you want something to index more or go faster or slower, you're going to want to get it so it rotates at a lower portion of the radius. If you, you'll probably have to draw a diagram, and I think later in this video I will put up a diagram of this, and we'll go through it on the drawing board. But speed and time is really important. Years ago, it used to be a thing to in what we called index our bird cages. It was moving the tire or the radius rod on a four-link bird cage basically on the left rear, moving it lower towards the center of the axle pivot a little bit, and then moving it forward. And this would put the spring and shock and that whole radius rod deal as the travel in your left rear goes down and your chassis goes up. This would put that radius rod and spin that bird cage just a little bit faster and put more wedge in the car. So we've always been kind of doing it, but I never hear anybody talk about speed and time. And I think if you think about all the radiuses in your car that things travel through, it all equates back to speed and time. So it's very important. You can adjust your camber gain in the front. Is the difference between the angles of your upper and lower control arms and where they are on the radius. Um, spindle heights, put those upper control arms or longer ball joints will put those upper control arms at different angles and the farther those things are into the lower portion of their travel radius the faster it will be and the more gain you will get the farther it travels so it's really important as you adjust your entire car and where things are and you get thinking about it is to think about the concept of speed and time when it when you're adjusting I guess pivots on a radius 
let's say you have a circle and this will represent travel of a radius rod or a spindle or something in a circular direction something with a center pivot to it we'll just call it like a ball joint or something now you have let's say a, a steering arm or something here that'll come out and it wants to travel around the circle well the point from here to here let's say we are going to get very little travel in the vertical direction but it will be a large amount of time but now as we get farther down the circle, let's say that this is equal to this in time, in distance. So it'll be the same amount of time as you're traveling the circle. But now our distance is getting further down the circle. This works in a lot of areas on our cars, and we'll get into a little bit more on where to look for it and where we use it and how to pay attention to it. But this is just a general overview. If your idea or your goal is to move up and down, you're not going to want to put this point up here you're gonna to want to be someplace past here to start off with so for the same amount of time you're doing a lot of movement vertically if your idea is to not move this can pivot without moving vertically much you're gonna to want to stay in this area best way I can describe this and probably the most obvious place is by drawing a spindle and how we get camber gain in the front end so let's draw a spindle real quick it's a real cheap spindle here's a lower ball joint here's an upper ball joint Here's a lower control arm. Now, if we want to get a lot of camber gain, you're going to want to pull this upper ball joint this way. And pulling that upper ball joint will tilt it here and give you a lot of camber gain. So, what you want to do is put a lot of control arm angle into it and let me show you why if you have a flat control arm something like this and it operates on our same radius and let's say our radius looks something like this with a flat control arm this suspension will travel from here to here and pull the upper ball joint very very little very little camber gain here but now if we put a lot of control arm angle into it and we start our control arm here our same amount of suspension travel let's say from here to here as we had before is going to pull that upper ball joint a lot and you're going to get a lot of camber gain so the idea of systems of speed and time and angles and how much horizontal or in some cases vertical movement that you get in the same amount of time depends on the angle of the starting point this is what I'm trying to get at and there's a lot of places on our car where we see this
Let's look at another example on our car where it's kind of really obvious, but I don't think a whole lot of people talk about it much. And it's the idea of a rotating assembly inside a motor. Speed and time and displacement. So let's say you have your piston. And you have your connecting rod. And your crank will rotate. Here's your deal. And then here's your crank will rotate in a rotation. Here's the center of your crankshaft. You get the top dead center and from here, let's say, to there, the piston will move up and down very little. You'll have a dwell where all three of these points kind of line up in your piston. At top dead center, you're going to have a dwell. And then as you get start down the other way is this upper portion, the piston will move up and down very little. But as you get to your 90 degree point, this is going to accelerate and you're, it'll be the fastest at your 90 degree point and it will travel the most to here and then you'll get the bottom it'll start slowing down as you get into this area here. This area and this area will travel at the same probably acceleration and then deceleration. And you'll get your dwell point here where the piston at one conceivable point in time will absolutely stop and then change direction. So if you want to move vertically very little, your piston, you want a big rotation or maybe a larger stroke so your circle is bigger so you have a more of a up and down movement in a larger area. You get more of a dwell at the top and the bottom. I'm sure motor builders and crank builders and everybody has this figured out, but this is just another area I'm talking about with speed versus time. Another area which is really common is panard bars. I'm going to show you a little something that we actually used on our cars a little bit. When a, you roll on your J-bar, the rear end will travel left to right as that J-bar stands up. So let's say you have the yoke on your rear end here, and you have your J-bar mount here, and you have, let's say, a medium J-bar here, and it goes to here. This angle here will operate on a circle, on a radius, around this point here. And your car, as you're, let's say this is your left rear and you're looking at it from the front, your car will raise up. Well, the flatter this is, say, let's say these two points were absolutely level, your rear end will move laterally very little where these are lined up most j-bars you're not you're never going to line these up but the closer you get to flat with your j-bar the more or the less that your rear end will travel side to side in your car the further and the more j-bar angle you have the further the I guess the rear end is going to travel left in the car as it gets further up the arc. Another thing holds true with J-bar length, and we had a problem for a while where a guy wanted his car really freed up, but he had a very short pannard bar in it. 
So all I told him is, put your panard bar in there, even if you wanted a lot of, I call it kinematic stick to the car, where the J bar angle will act and push the right rear end of the track a little bit. Even if you were to lengthen your J bar out quite a ways, that makes this radius quite a bit bigger. So the lateral movement in the car with a longer J bar for the same amount of time that it takes to rotate it up will move the rear end left, left slower than a shorter J bar. So even if you want a lot of angle, like I said, for that kinematic stick, but you want your car freed up, and you don't want to move that rear end laterally in the car as fast or as much, put a longer J-bar in it so the dwell points in the same amount of time will act slower because the radius is more. You see what I'm saying? If you like this video and you like other videos on the site, subscribe to the channel below and ring the bell for notifications when I put more videos up. And below this in the description area, I also put links to where I can be found on Facebook and on Twitter, links to my blog, um, and also a link to where I sell my book on Amazon if you're interested in a book. We'll see you in the next video.